Certainly, their conventional capabilities have been dramatically degraded. Uh, reportedly, have lost at least half of their tank fleet uh, without the capacity to replace it. Missile stocks are dwindling. Uh, one of the reports in the last 24 hours or so is that it appears that they can only conduct missile attacks twice a week now instead of every night. Certainly, they still have Iranian drones and others to cause additional casualties and damage to infrastructure uh, and so forth. Uh, but no, they have been dramatically weakened. I think that their conventional forces have been set back at least a generation or so. Uh, and the military industrial complex uh, does not appear remotely capable of spooling up, if you will, to replace what it is that they have lost. In fact, uh, it's hard pressed even to repair what has been lost. Retired U.S. General David Petraeus recently gave an interview discussing the military capabilities of Russia and the United States. According to Petraeus, Russia's conventional military forces have been significantly weakened with the reported loss of at least half of their tank fleet and dwindling missile stocks. Although Russia still possesses Iranian drones and other capabilities to cause damage, but they've been set back at least a generation in terms of conventional forces, and the military-industrial complex appears unable to replace what has been lost. However, there is no denying that Russia still remains a significant economic power as one of the largest producers of natural gas, crude oil, coal, strategic minerals, and agricultural products in the world. This means that Russia's military power should not be counted out and global efforts should be made to deter the use of its nuclear arsenal, the largest in the world. Petraeus also discussed the ongoing transformation of the US military, transitioning from a small number of large and expensive platforms to a larger number of much smaller unmanned systems. This includes systems on the surface of the ocean, subsea, on the ground, in space, and even in cyberspace. The transition will take a long time, but it is necessary to adequately defend against vulnerability. In terms of practical strategies, Petraeus emphasized the need to harden U.S. bases, improve their defenses, and increase production levels of a variety of ammunition and end items. This has been recognized by NATO leaders with efforts underway to increase production levels in response to the high rate of consumption on the battlefield in Ukraine. Russia still has lots of other capabilities, including uh, the largest nuclear arsenal in the world. And size doesn't necessarily matter there beyond a certain point, to be sure. We obviously have a very substantial nuclear force as well, and it's a triad and more than adequate for deterrence. Uh, but again, that capability is there. Uh, we should be concerned about the possibility of it being used. We should take measures to ensure that Vladimir Putin is deterred from employing it, and those measures have been taken. Um, U.S. leaders have, for example, said that there were publicly that there would be uh, catastrophic consequences for such use. Uh, and in fact, the Chinese and Indian leaders have cautioned Putin against using nuclear weapons. So there should be a global effort, as there has been, frankly, to ensure that that component of his military power is an employee. Beyond that, let's not overlook the continuing economic capability of Russia. It still is one of the largest natural gas and crude oil and coal producers in the world. There are a number of countries in the world still willing to buy that at a considerable discount to be sure, but still the world does need uh, that oil, gas and coal. Uh, and it also produces strategic minerals and agricultural products that other countries are willing to buy as well. So Russia will be dramatically diminished in terms of its conventional military capabilities, but it's by no means a country that should be counted out. One of the biggest of the big ideas about transformation of the U.S. forces in particular is that we are transitioning from a small number of very large and incredibly capable, heavily manned and exorbitantly expensive platforms, the most substantial of which of course is an aircraft carrier, but also other major maritime combatants, aircraft, the F-35, main battle tanks, etc. And we're going to transition to a larger number of much smaller unmanned systems. And it's not just the drones as we currently think of them in the sky. Uh, it's on the surface of the ocean. It's subsea. It's on the ground. Uh, it's in space, even in cyberspace. Uh, and these are systems, some of which will be remotely piloted, others of which will be algorithmically 
driven. Some may be together with man systems, some may be completely apart from them. Is a transition, a transformation that will take a very long time and we're not going to give up all of the small number of large platforms by any means. Those are still hugely, incredibly useful in a variety of different scenarios. But if you are in a world where if it can be seen, it can be hit, and if it can be hit, it can be killed, then you've got to make that transition because unless you can adequately defend those platforms, and by the way, we also have to defend our bases, we have to harden those, make them more resilient, again, improve their defenses, uh, our headquarters around the world, et cetera, uh, particularly in a particular theater. Uh, if you don't do that, again, the vulnerability is going to be very, very high. So rather than the, again, thinking of the drones that you see in the sky in Ukraine, which, which are, again, quite modest in their capability, their range, their uh, flight time, and so forth, used very effectively, especially by the Ukrainians, who have shown a real facility for integrating their capabilities with precision munitions. Uh, despite that, what we would see in the future is just dramatically different. Again, the ranges, the speed, the capabilities, and the sheer number of these will be extraordinary. Well, it is already affecting uh, production levels in the United States and NATO countries. One of the big outcomes of a variety of the different multilateral meetings um, and even fora like the Munich Security Conference has been a recognition, a broad recognition by NATO leaders that we have to increase the production of a variety of different uh, types of ammunition and so forth, even some major end items given the extraordinary rate of consumption on the battlefield in Ukraine. And so that is actually happening. The U.S., for example, the last I saw is trying to double the monthly production of 155 millimeter heavy artillery rounds uh, and a variety of other rounds, again, that are being consumed at a high rate uh, on this particular battlefield. Um, as to the strategy, I think it gives some insights into the way to harden the country that might be applicable elsewhere the so-called hedgehog or the poison frog or whatever the analogy that you want to use in the metaphorical image um, that again could be useful in other locations. And beyond that, I think there, there will be a conviction out of this that when this is all done, and it will at some point be all done, and I tend to think there will be some kind of negotiated resolution at some point. Overall, Patrice's interview highlights the ongoing shift in military capabilities and the need for continued vigilance and adaptation in the face of evolving threats. While Russia's conventional military forces may have been significantly weakened, their economic power and nuclear arsenal still make them a formidable opponent. The U.S. military must continue to transform and adapt to new technologies and threats to adequately defend against vulnerabilities and maintain deterrence.